In this week's lecture, I'm going to cover um, user equilibrium um, uh, topic, but uh, extending it to a stochastic user equilibrium, where we consider some stochasticity and imperfection of knowledge of the travel times in the network. Uh, so if I just do a, a little bit of refreshment from last week. Uh, so last week we covered UE with elastic demand, where we talked about how demand is reactive or elastic to system performance or the minimum travel time. And what we did last week was we revised the formulation of UE and we added this um, elastic term into it, um, given a demand function. Uh, and then um, we also went over um, a modified algorithm of MSA or Frank Wolf. Um, that it works pretty much like MSA and Frank Wolf, but the only thing that is added is we load the network, uh, we load the demand given using that demand function that we had. And we also keep track of the demand um, and in, in each iteration. And we've gone over an example on the slide and in an Excel sheet. Uh, so hopefully that's clear to you. And um, today I'm going to go over uh, motivation and interpretation of a stochastic user equilibrium. Why do we actually need a stochastic user equilibrium? What does it mean? What, it, what does it try to capture? Then I'll talk about route choice models within the context of uh, a stochastic user equilibrium, and then we'll go over some of the formulation. How can we actually formulate a stochastic UE in, uh, as an optimization? And then we also go over an example and solution algorithm. Okay. Uh, so about motivation, um, but why another variant of traffic assignment? I mean, we've already had UE and UE elastic demand, why do we need and why should we care about UE with a stochastic, uh, a stochastic UE? Um, so if you remember in the UE uh, uh, context, uh, we assumed that users have full knowledge, full knowledge and also perfect knowledge of the traffic conditions in the network to seek the minimum travel time. So what we did assume was we assumed that if anybody wants to go from A to B, the traveler knows exactly what is the travel time on each route in the network. And that's not a very accurate assumption, right? Because we know it's not necessarily true. Not everybody in the network, when, 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 when we want to leave our origin or home to our desk, going to our destination, we don't necessarily have a perfect knowledge of what's going on in the network. Um, so that's not an exactly correct assumption. Um, in, in the UE with elastic demand, uh, we still have that assumption that we think users uh, still have a full and perfect knowledge of what's going on in the network in terms of travel times. But we assume that travel demand is actually variable and reacts to how much travel times go up and down. So if travel if the minimum travel time increases, uh, demand will be suppressed. If the minimum travel time goes down, um, uh, all close to 100% of the demand will get into the network and try to get to destinations with whatever mode of travel they're going. Um, but in a stochastic user equilibrium, what we try to do differently is that we try, we, we assume users are, users make errors in their route choice. Uh, so there is some level of randomness in the um, route choice behavior of users. And because they don't, they may not necessarily know the correct or true travel time of different routes, instead of saying, instead of saying travelers will minimize their travel time, we introduce this new notion of perceived travel time. Because again, and that is, that is closer to what happens in reality, because if I wanna go from home to work after lockdown, after lockdown is lifted, um, I don't exactly know how long it takes from my home to UNSW, 
I just roughly know, right? I don't exactly know whether is it like, like I don't know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, 25, sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's 20 minutes, right? Um, and, but I only have a perception of that travel time. So I think the per, I, whatever route I take, I believe that I'm going to minimize the perceived travel time rather than the actual travel time. So as I said, users may not know exactly the actual travel time on any link or path. So therefore the decisions are made based on their perception of the travel time. And this perceived travel time can be represented by a random variable following a specific distribution. So, and that's how we introduced the stochasticity or randomness to the UE problem. Uh, in, in connection with that perceived travel time, uh, we say, we introduce this, we say travel time is, is now going to be represented by a random va variable that follows a specific distribution. Um, so if I want to connect this whole idea to um, um, SUE condition, so SUE stands for stochastic user equilibrium, so from now on I'm going to say SUE interchangeably with the stochastic user equilibrium. Um, what we can say is that SUE conditions are achieved when the proportion of the OD demand going from R to S assigned to a path K is equal to the probability, probability that the route travel time is minimal. Okay, so let me let me go back to UE first. Let me go back to UE first and see what what was UE and then. What is SUE? What, what UE tries to achieve and then what SUE achieves? In UE, we try to achieve a, a condition, a point that no traveler can unilaterally improve his or, his, or, his or her travel time by changing routes, right? And that was equivalent to saying between any specific OD, all the used paths will have exactly the same travel time, right? But in a stochastic user equilibrium, what we say is we still follow the same uh, structure. We say no traveler can unilaterally improve his or her own perceived travel time by changing a route. And and again, try trying to include that as stochasticity and randomness, that probabilistic view into the formulation, SUE conditions we then say are achieved when this PRSK is actually the proportion of demand that is assigned to different passes. So for example, if I have R and S, and if I have three different passes, uh, K1, K2, and K3, okay? PR, a small PRSK, so for example, PRS1, PRS2, and PRS3, represents the um, the proportion, the percentage of the demand that goes from R to S. For example, if I have 100 people going from R to S, and if PRS1 is, let's say, 50%, PRS2 could be 20%, and PRS3 is 30%. OK? How can I, I used, I was able to erase this before. I can't erase this. Uh, yeah, I can. Um, yeah, but anyways, so so these would be the proportions of the demand that takes any of these available passes between these R and S, right? And obviously, because these are proportions of that, that demand value, uh, PRSK, if I sum it up across all the Ks for that RS, that is equal to what? Equal to one, right? Because this 50% plus 20% plus 30% is equal to one or 100%, right? So PRS1 plus PRS2 plus PRS3 in this little example is actually equal to one because we want to make sure all the demand actually loads into the network, but proportionally with different fractions, with different proportions into the available paths. But how can we get that proportion? What is that proportion? So how, how can we know what percentage of that demand goes to path one, what percentage goes to path two and path three? 
that's where this probabilistic formulation comes into play, where we say that proportion of the demand that goes to path K going between R and S comes from a probability. So the probability of this capital C is actually the perceived travel time of path K is a smaller or equal to the perceived travel time of path L or any other path. So this could be path, uh, this is path K, this is path L, okay, for example. And the proportion of the demand that goes to path K is equal to the probability of the cost, the perceived travel time or the perceived cost of path K being a smaller or equal to uh, cost of any other paths uh, in that uh, between that OD. So see this L, it, this, this could be L, this could be L. If I had another path, this could be L. So the, the probability of this cost, the cost, the perceived cost, the perceived travel time of this path being equal or smaller than uh, the perceived travel time of any of all the other paths basically. So if we get, I mean, we're gonna go over this that how can we actually calculate this probability? But imagine we kind of calculate this probability, which we're gonna see in a minute, and then we get this PRSK, okay? And that is only the proportion so far, okay? But how can we convert that proportion to the actual flow? Uh, it's easy. You, we just need to multiply that proportion by the demand, and then you get the path flows, right? So this is the path flow. Just like the example I made here, if, if it is 50%, 20%, 30%, if you just multiply that by 100 demand that is going, if that 100 demand was five, it could be a thousand, whatever. So this is my D, this is my D here. So that 50% multiplied by D would give me the actual path flow on that specific path. 20% multiply demand is uh, the path flow for that for, for the other path. So we have this uh, path flow FRS K is equal to the proportion of uh, PRS K multiplied by the demand between RS. Okay, so it's a simple uh, conversion from proportions that we calculate from the probabilities to the to to get the path flows. So just a recap here, capital C again is the perceived travel time. We're gonna still stick to a small C as the actual travel time. So if you look at this capital C formulation here, so capital C is the perceived travel time. A small C is the actual travel time. So this is the actual travel time. And we have this error term. And that is the error term in relation to that perception of travel time because, because the perceived travel time is not exactly equal to the actual travel time, we include this error term. And if the error term is high, if, if it is large, if it has a large value, that means the perceived travel time is probably far from uh, the actual travel time. If error term was zero, that means perceived travel time is actually exactly the same as the actual travel time. And then what will happen is all this SUE concept uh, collapses into just the traditional UE, right? If the error term is zero, that means, again, it's a perfect knowledge, right? If error is high, that kind of shows how, how much imperfection we have in terms of knowledge of the travel times in the network, okay? So, so far we know, we, we kind of we saw that we need to calculate this proportion give, uh, using a probability function, and then we convert that proportions to path flows. But let's, um, uh, yeah, let, let me also go over this and then I'll talk about the probabilities. You remember I said if the, um, if that error term is equal to zero, SUE collapses into UE. And, and that is because UE is actually a special case of SUE. What kind of a special case? when error is actually equal to zero, right? If the error is actually to zero, SUE is equivalent to UE. So S SUE formulation or framework is actually a more a generic framework that you can actually get the UE out of it as well. So um, just like what I said, if error term is actually equal to zero, capital C would be equal to a small C. And then 
and here is a kind of a proof to show that it actually collapses to UE even if error term is actually equal to zero. So two, two things may happen. If the small CRSK is smaller than the uh, CRSL, the path, if the, if the actual cost of path K is smaller or equal to the cost of path L, uh, and L could be all the other paths available within R and S, then, of course, this probability or this proportion that we want to calculate will be between zero and one, right? So the, the proportion, either it's zero or it could have any other value in between all the way to one. We cannot have anything lower than zero. We cannot have anything larger than one, right? Because we're going to conserve the demand. And then if we have, just like the example I had, it could be 0.5, it could be 0.2, it could be 0.3. So if that's the case, the flow is equal to proportion multiplied by demand, as I said. But there's also another case that could happen. And that is the case when this PRSK is actually equal to zero. If that is equal to zero, what does it mean? It means that a specific path K, nobody is gonna use it, right? So the flow is actually gonna be equal to zero. So all of these above calculations are actually equivalent to looking at this, where you remember this was one of the optimality conditions of the UE. And we said this must be equal to zero. And the only way this is equal to zero, it's either FRSK is equal to zero, which is in this case, or CRS minus this pi, this pi was the shortest pass, if you remember, shortest pass travel time, um, is equal to zero. And that is kind of show that how this is stochastic UE can actually collapse to the uh, same optimality condition that we went over uh, as part of the UE. But anyways, um, that was just a bit of a um, higher level discussions on how exactly SUE is a general case of a UE and how it can collapse into it. But let me go back to the more practical stuff that um, I told you we need to calculate these proportions using a probability function, right? And that's where route choice models come into play. Um, there are many different ways of modeling route choice. One theory that is commonly used is called random utility theory. Uh, or it is also sometimes called utility maximization. Some other theories that exist, which some of them, for example, another one that is also not as commonly, but maybe the second common uh, theory is the regret minimization. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on that as, as, as well. So in random utility theory or utility maximization, what we say is we say uh, uh, in any route, if I have three possible routers to take from, uh, all, these pa all these routes can have a utility value. And I will pick the one that maximizes the utility for me. So if route one maximizes its utility, has the maximum utility for me, I will choose that route. If another route has the maximum utility, I'll go after that one. And this could be different from one person to another. Um, and again, this kind of this theory and this choice modeling goes beyond route choice. It can actually be applied to anything, any other choice. For example, if you want to buy a new mobile phone, would you choose between uh, Samsung Galaxy versus iPhone or Google? Uh, what is the new Google Pixel? Pixel was the or uh, yeah, I think Pixel was the name of the Google phone, right? Um, so would you go after Samsung Galaxy iPhone or a Google phone? So you have three choices. Which one would you pick? So in your mind, you have a utility for each of these choices. You think about their features. You, you think about their advantages, disadvantages, et cetera, et cetera. So you have some utility function in your mind that uh, if you decide rationally again, uh, you will go with a mobile phone that has the maximum utility for you. Same thing applies to any other marketing um, 
a problem. If you want to choose between, uh, I don't know, product one versus product two, product three, if you want to choose between vanilla ice cream versus chocolate ice cream. Uh, so it's the same concept, the same probabilities, probabilistic approach. They're, and they're all called choice models. And in this specific case, in the context of traffic assignment, we all we look at route choice models, okay? Not ice cream choice models or mobile phone choice models. We go we go after route choice models. But anyways, let's go over this random utility theory, and then I'll show you how the probabilities can be calculated. So what we do is um, we have a group of individuals that they want to need they need to select or choose one and only one option from a set of alternatives. And again, that's important, right? Because in, in, in not every choice setup um, requires you to only choose one and only one option, right? Just like multiple choice problems, sometimes you, have, you can choose two, two correct answers or three choices. But in this case, remember that we are only looking and modeling, uh, selecting one and only one option from a set of alt available alternatives. So if I have five available routes between my origin and destination, I'm going to only choose one of them, right? Because I cannot take two at the same time simultaneously. Um, so the other thing, is, as I said before, is every individual will select the alternative that maximizes its own utility. How do we define this utility? We usually use the notation UX. U stands for utility here. There X is a vector of factors that is affecting that utility. In terms of route choice, that X could represent travel time, travel distance, safety, uh, quality of the pavement, if you care about that, greenness, are you gonna go over a, a very leafy green route or are you happy with a, a street that doesn't really have any planting around it? Uh, do you care uh, about going on arterials or do you wanna take the highway? Do you want to avoid tollways or are you okay with it? So all of these factors can go into this X, uh, can go into this X in the utility function. Um, and then uh, we assume that the utility function is can be formed as a linear function uh, with all these factors in place. So for example, in terms of route choice, if I say my X1 is travel time, x2 is distance and x3 is toll my utility function would for would would look like something would look something like this my utility function would be um, equal to beta 1 is the parameter that we have to estimate uh, just like any uh, linear uh, equation right so beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus an error term. Okay, and again, this is, this is the same error term as we talked before. Um, so here, I, I, I'm assuming that route choice, the only factors that are affecting people's route choice is travel time, distance, and toll, for example. And then uh, this would be my utility function. So now imagine I have three possible routes going from an origin to a destination. This one has a travel time of one, this one has a travel time of two, this one has a travel time of three. All of the distances, let's say it's equal, and then one of them has a toll of zero dollar, the other one has a toll of one dollar, and the other one has a toll of, let's say, five dollars. And I can actually put all these values into this utility function, assuming I know what these coefficients are, and then I can calculate the utility for every route. So for all of these routes that are available between R and S, I can calculate what is the value of utility of route one, what is the value of utility of route two, and what is the utility value of route three. Now that I have all the utilities, I can actually Mac try to see whichever is greatest, uh, I will pick. But if I look at the whole population, I can probabilistically say which route uh, is going to be most likely selected by uh, some individuals. So, so we said, uh, let me not skip myself. Uh, I'm actually going a little bit, I'm actually skipping myself a little bit here. Um, so the utility function, 
uh, we assume that it is a linear form of this with the error term at the end, where beta is the vector of the parameters, as I just talked about, and the error term is the random variable that is used to account for, we usually call it unobserved attributes. So for example, in this example that I had, that I said travel time, distance, and toll are the factors that um, can form this utility function, but in reality, there might be a lot more factors, right? Uh, again, um, there is something called habit uh, or inertia um, where you stick to the route that you, you are used to it, even if it is not the best route. Uh, that could be another factor in the model, but I'm not including it. The greenness, the, sto the slope, uh, or the number of signals that you have to pass uh, you have to go through, that could be another factor that, co that can go into the utility function, but I'm not including them. So all of those factors that I'm not including in the utility function can actually go into this error term here. And that's what we call unobserved attributes. So let's have a look. So we, we, we define this utility function of IK. I is the individual here, individual and k is the alternative that I have or the option because you can calculate actually the utility for any specific option for any specific person. Then we say the probability that this i, this the probability that individual i selects this alternative k is equal to probability of the utility of this alternative k for this specific individual i is greater or equal than the utility of individual i selecting uh, the other alternatives. All the other alternatives are L, the one that is selected is k. So the probability, what is the probability of the utility of k uh, is greater or equal than the utility of all the other alternatives? And um, obviously, this p, this probability, right? It all depends on this error term because look at the utility function. Everything is deterministic. The only thing that is random in this function is this error term. So depending on what distribution that error term has, this probability will be different. And that's where the different formulations come into play. So in general, we have two main categories of discrete choice models. Uh, we have one called logit model and the other one is called probit model. In the logit model, we assume that epsilon is actually following a Gumbel distribution. In the, probit in, the, in the probit model, we assume that that error term is actually following a normal distribution. In this class, I'm not gonna go over probit model. We're gonna only focus on the logit model, okay? It's simple, it's very commonly used uh, in many modeling practices in transport. So, so remember so far, we have been able to calculate the utility of person I selecting alternative K, okay? And we also know, we also calculate utility of person I selecting all the other alter alternatives L. Then how can I calculate the, the, the actual probability of I being selected? We use this logit formula. We call this a logit formula, which says the probability of person I selects alternative K is actually equal to the exponential of utility of I selecting K over the summation of exponential of u utility i and l utility of all the other alternatives for individual i let me make another example let me make an example here so imagine i have three possible routes be going between r and s and this is route 1 route 2 route 3 Imagine I have a utility function that I can calculate for each route, and I have my u1, u2, and u3 calculated, and each of them could have a value. Now, if I want to calculate the 
um, probability of, uh, let me erase this so I have a little bit of white space here too so I can write on. So if I want to calculate what is the probability of uh, uh, route one being selected, probability of route one being selected is actually equal to the exponential of utility of route one divided by exponential of u1 plus exponential of u2 plus exponential of u3. So in the denominator, I have the, ex the summation of the exponential of all the available alternatives, including the one that is selected, okay? So you see I have u1 in the denominator as well. So I have e u exponential of u1 plus exponential of u2 plus exponential of u3. And on the top, I have exponential of the selected route, e u1. And using this simple formula, I can actually calculate the probability of route one being selected. Let me see if I have an example here. Yes, I do have an example, and it is a non-transport example. Great. So have a look at this example. Uh, you, you can choose a drink among three alternatives, juice, Coke, and beer. Consider two persons, X and Y, Imagine we have two different people want to choose between these three different drinks and somehow we have a utility function, okay? It doesn't matter what the actual function is for what the utility, actual utility function is in this example because we only care about the value of the utility here, okay? Um, at least in this example. So this table gives us, this is the utility table. This gives us the the value of the utilities for each of these choices for every specific individual. So uh, for, for individual X, uh, juice has a utility value of four, Coke has a utility value of four, beer has a utility value of two. So this would be UXJ is equal to four. That is the utility of J being selected by X, a utility of, person X selecting C, utility of person X selecting B, right? And the other one is if so, the other person, person Y, if what is the utility of selecting juice for person Y? Um, y, J, U, Y, C, U, Y, B, okay? So again, imagine we had a function uh, here that we could, that we use to calculate all these values. And this is given to you, okay? At least in this example, this is given. Uh, but in reality, we have to actually estimate that function f and try to use that a specific function, like a linear function, as I told you before, to calculate this table. Anyways, let's, let's assume that we've got these utility values for every alternative, for every individual. And how can I know what is the probability of, um, person X selecting Coke. So now I want to calculate the probability of Coke being selected by person X. What I need to do is, so PR XC is actually equal to exponential of UXC, right? Because that is the selected alternative by individual X that we want to calculate. And what is it? It's four here, right? So this would be e power four, so exponential of four, divided by exponential of, uh, this is juice, this is Coke, and this is beer. So exponential of u x j plus exponential of u x c plus exponential of u x b. And that would be E4 in the top, and in the denominator, I have E4 plus E4. So this is four, this is four, and now this is two plus E2. So if you calculate that, you get this 0.468, and that is the probability of person X selecting Coke. If you want to calculate the probability of person Y selecting Coke, um, we just do it using, again, the logit formula, but putting in 
the the correct uh, utility values. So probability of person Y selecting Coke is actually equal to the exponential of the utility of Y selecting Coke over all the summation of the utilities, right? So in this case, it would be exponential of Y selecting Coke, which is four, and then over exponential of Y selecting juice, exponential of Y selecting Coke, exponential of Y selecting beer. So again, if you put all these numbers into place, you'll, you'll see that the probability that person Y selects Coke would be 0.576. And then you can do that for all the other alternatives. So what is the probability of juice being selected by X? What is the probability of beer selecting by Y? So you can apply that to everything. So uh, to all of, the, all, all of the available alternatives here, okay? Uh, because I hope this uh, drink example uh, made it a little bit more clear to you that how an actual choice model works. Again, in that example, in that drink example, we did not deal with the actual utility function, but you were given the value of the utilities for any specific alternative for every individual. But in reality, uh, we, have, we need to have a function to use to calculate those values, uh, which again, we're gonna see now probably. Yeah, that's actually the slides I'm gonna talk about now. Uh, any question before I start? Was it clear? Is it good now? I mean, do you have a good understanding of uh, what a choice model is and how we can use a logit model, a logit formula to calculate the probabilities? Now let's apply, let's extend that example to the an actual route choice. So let's extend the example to an actual route choice where um, in the route choice, we are interested in aggregated choice. So we're not necessarily interested in individual choices. I don't care if Mr. X or Mrs. Y is taking X and Y because I only care about the link volumes, right? I don't care about who is using which route. I just wanna know how many people are actually using X versus Y. How many people are actually using, sorry, K versus L, for example. So I need, I want the aggregate choice. So the proportion that we calculated, we talked about before, that PRSK of the demand uh, gives me that aggregated number, right? So if I calculate this PRSK using the logit formula, and if I multiply it by the demand that goes from an origin to destination, I get that actual path flow value that I want, that I'm interested in. I'm not interested to know who is using which route. I want to know what is the val what is the total path flow of this specific path that is trans that can be translated into link volumes, right? And now let's talk about the utility function in the route choice context. So what we can do here as a simple assumption is we can assume that the utility associated with the route can be defined only based on its perceived travel time. So that means I'm, I'm saying URSK is actually a function of CRSK. It's a function of the perception of the travel time. And then I can say, again, you remember we said that little utility function, uh, we, we, we usually assume it's a linear function. So I say it can be, uh, it's, it's beta, C, R, S, K, as simple as that, plus an error term. So my utility function in the route choice can simply be a, 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 par, a parameter beta or a variable, uh, not a variable, a coefficient, sorry, a coefficient beta multiplied by the perceived travel time plus an error term. And this beta needs to be calibrated and estimated based on some real data. So if I collect route choice information from many of you, I can actually use all of that data to actually calculate what that beta value is. Estimation of that beta value itself is a big deal and there, there are tons of inf you know content and methods and uh, solutions for it. It's beyond um, 
uh, the scope of this class. Um, so I'm not going to talk about how that beta value can be calculated. In many of the examples, actually in all of the examples and problems we're going to see, uh, I will give you the utility function so you can use it. So I will give you that beta value. But then you need to use that utility function to calculate the utility of each available route, okay? So anyways, let's get back to this. And in this case, uh, let's, let's try to interpret this. Uh, one question that I can pose here to get you a little bit of thinking is, do you think this beta value is whatever value it has, what about its sign? Is it going to be a positive number or a negative number? For example, is it point? Is it plus 0.5 or is it minus 0.5? Uh, and how does it? How can we actually interpret that? So, if you look at this utility function here, remember I said if the utility of one alternative is larger than all the other alternatives, that alternative is most likely to get selected. So if I have three possible routes going from R to S and the utility of this route is 0.7, that means with the probability of 0.7, every individual will select that route, right? So overall, that means 70% of people will take that route. And the others are, let's say, 0.1 and 0.2. So, so a larger utility, what does it mean? A larger utility means it is a most likely selected util, uh, alternative. So the larger utility gets, the probability of that alternative gets selected goes higher as well. So it, is, it, it becomes a more likely a choice for many people. And in case, in terms of route choice, so this is CRSK, right? So if, and this is travel time, right? This is perceived, sorry, this is perceived travel time. If perceived travel time goes high, do I expect the utility goes high or down? Imagine I have uh, three different routes going from R to S. If the, if the travel time of this route goes high, if the perceived travel time of that route goes high, what does it mean? It means it becomes a less attractive option, right? Because it is taking longer time to get to my destination. So what should happen to utility if the travel time goes high? Actually, the utility should come down, right? So if the, if the, if the perceived travel time goes high, the utility will should should go down. So what does that mean? That actually means this beta is actually negative, right? Whatever value it has, it should always be negative, like 0.5 or uh, 0.7, or even like it doesn't have to be smaller than one. It could have any value, right? So let's say minus n, if n is an is a positive in, is a positive real number. So that's why in this formula, I mean, I told you all that story to tell you to justify why I'm writing it this way. So I say utility of RSK is actually equal to minus theta. This minus theta is actually my, bet, my beta. Uh, let me just erase this. Yep. So this whole minus theta here is my beta. So and theta here is only a positive value. So theta is uh, greater than zero. Uh, that's why my beta is actually minus theta here. I mean, I should just, I could just put beta here and just tell you that beta could, is a negative value, has a negative value, but you can also write it this way. It's, they're equivalent, right? So anyways, and then um, if you remember, uh, I also said that this C, capital C is actually, capital C is actually a small c plus epsilon, right? So what happens is I have this capital C plus, sorry, capital C plus epsilon inside the parenthesis. So beta or if I, instead of beta, I can say minus theta gets multiplied by C plus epsilon. So it gives me minus theta C minus theta epsilon, right? And I can easily, to be honest, replace this minus theta epsilon with a plus another epsilon, right? Like epsilon prime, let's call it, or whatever. So it's still epsilon, right? Uh, but still, I'm going to keep it that way because I want to show you later something else. Um, and then 
if I want to use logit model, what should I, what, what do we assume? We assume this error, whether you call it epsilon prime or just if, 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 whether you just go with minus theta epsilon, it's, it's still the error term, right? Uh, is following a Gumbel distribution and therefore uh, I, I just use the rest of the equation in the utility function. We call this part the deterministic part of the utility function. The error term is the stochastic part of the utility function. And we use this, I use this deterministic part of the utility function and use the logit formula to calculate the uh, probability or the fraction of, or the proportion of uh, people who are going to use uh, route K, which is basically exponential of the utility of route K, which is minus theta CRSK divided by what? The summation of all, the summation of the exponential of all the other utility functions. So it would be summation of epsilon minus theta CRSL for all the Ls, including K itself, okay? So very similar to that drink example, the only thing that is different here is instead of giving you the value of the utilities, I'm giving you the utility function. And the utility function is this function, the deterministic portion of it. It's minus theta multiplied by CRSK. Um, and this CRSK, is the actual travel time, right? Um, yeah. And um, I think I talked about this, that this part is the error term and we assume it follows a Gumbel distribution, as I said. And, but let's also talk about, I think I also talked about this, that what does this theta, so we talked about theta being positive and negative or beta being positive and negative, right? So, and we, we learned that, yes, it has to be negative always. That's why I have that negative uh, thing behind it. But what about theta? What does it mean? If theta, is, if theta is high versus theta is small, what does it mean? So if theta is high, a large theta actually means a small perception error. Again, the reason I kept this, that's where I, that's, you can see why I kept the error term as minus theta epsilon here, because I wanted to show you this, that the um, I can actually um, define, use use maybe a capital eta, uh, zeta, or whatever I want to do, whatever notation you want to use here. Um, let's, let's use a capital epsilon, I don't know. Um, is this capital epsilon or my epsilon prime or whatever is equal to minus theta epsilon, right? So that actually means the error here is what? Is one over theta, this capital epsilon. So if theta is large, that means epsilon goes down. If theta is small, epsilon is large, right? Because it's in the denominator. Uh, so that's just the, just, it's just the interpretation of what that theta actually means, having it a large, giving it a large value, what does it mean? Giving it a, giving it a low value, what does it mean? Okay. Um, some other remarks on some of the assumptions of the route choice model before we actually go and actually see an example of a route choice model. So if you just bear with me a little bit more, we're going to see an example. Um, is that error term that we talked about in the utility function? That error term. Um, yes, it follows a Gumbel distribution, but there is another important assumption behind it, and that is called IID assumption, or independent and identically distributed. So this error term is actually um, independent across alternatives, so um, and across individuals. Um, because we're calculating this i k, right? So across all the alternatives and uh, across all the individuals. So this error term, we assume that it is independent from one person to another, from one alternative to another alter alternative. However, they are all following an identical distribution, identical Gumbel distribution. So 
Look, in reality, we have to assume this IID holds, uh, but in reality, again, it's beyond the scope of the class at why this IID matters and how it is affecting the choice models. But in reality, this IID doesn't necessarily hold because imagine we are a member of a household and um, uh, you, you want to take one route versus another. I, I, two of you, you're driving with your partner, you're driving with your another member of your household, and um, you take a specific route, not necessarily because it's, um, it's because, not necessarily because that's the, that's your choice that maximizes your utility, but just because, I don't know, your partner wants that route or, um, you know, for whatever reason. So in that case, if there is a relationship, if there is a relation between your choice behavior and the other person who is with you in the car, then that error term is no longer really independent, right? You are affecting each other's choice. So this IID doesn't really hold anymore, right? But, in, but anyways, for simplicity in, in logit modeling, we assume IID holds. There is another issue. Uh, another issue, uh, this is a very significant issue, actually, the, the, the route overlap, which two paths may actually share some common links between them. So imagine um, I want to go from this origin to this destination, okay? I can take this path. This is my path number one. Or I can take this path. This is my path number two. So you can see these two paths have a, a small portion that is shared. This part is shared, or doors, these two paths have this segment, they have an overlapping segment. This is an overlapping segment. And again, there's another assumption in choice modeling, and we call that uh, uh, IIA this time, and that stands for um, irrelevant and independent alternatives. So this one is called irrelevant and independent alternatives, uh, which says the choices that we have must be independent of each other. But in this case, if I have some overlap, between two of my paths, two of my choices, that means IIA does not hold. So this overlap is actually related to IIA. This IIA does not hold in reality. It does not hold in reality, right? But again, sometimes we ignore this, um, which is not, not good, not the best practice, but there are also ways of accounting for this overlapping in route choice model. But again, I'm not gonna cover that in this course, but just wanted to give you some of the limitations and assumptions and some remarks here that is important. Uh, what else I have here? Route choice probabilities are determined based on the travel time only in the example. And uh, just like what I talked about, the, we have usually, we, in this course, we assume the utility function is only a function of the travel time, not any other factor like toll or uh, greenness or whatever. Um, and uh, I think I told you that I'm not going to talk about probit model much in this course, but uh, the reason probit model has been proposed in the literature is it because it addresses this IID uh, assumption issue that um, if IID doesn't hold in Logit, uh, probit can come in and help, but uh, one problem with probit model is it is more computationally expensive, uh, but that, and that's why logit is actually more commonly used. But anyways, I mean, this was just a general high-level uh, 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 summary of some of the limitations and assumptions and remarks about the logit model.